welcome to this Agilent Technologies recorded webcast. We hope you find this webcast both interesting and valuable. If after viewing this recording you are interested in more, go to Agilent TM webcast YouTube channel for more recordings or sign up for one of our upcoming live sessions at www.agilent.com slash find slash web underscore seminars. Now, over to the presenter. Yeah, hello. Uh, also from my side, uh, I would like to welcome you to this um, webcast uh, about PCI Express 3 receiver testing. Um, these are the topics that I want to cover today. Uh, we start with a little bit of changes in file layer from PCI Express 2 to PCI Express 3 and where they stem from. And then um, big portion of this um, webcast we are going to um, discuss and learn about the test setup for ASICs according to the base specification, the related calibration process, and the practical test setup with Agilent JBIRD and 4903B. And uh, at the end, I want to give a little bit of an outlook on what is going to come with um, CAM testing, uh, which you find in workshops. We will have literature and questions and answers at the end. Okay, uh, starting with why is the file layer so different? You probably may know, um, you have heard about it or you are very well aware that uh, PCI Express 3 is running at 8 gigabit and uh, this is not twice as much as uh, PCI Express 2 was running at with 5 gigabits. And you may ask yourself, where's all the, where are all these changes coming from? Well, looking at the at the goals um, that were there when we started PCI Express 3, they were basically related to the, to the physical layer. There were two goals that are important. That is that the effective data rate should be doubled and the existing infrastructures of PCs or servers shall be reusable, which in terms of the specification means that all the channels that were compliant with PCI Express 3 should also be compliant with PCI Express Three. So everything that was compliant with PCI Express 2 shall be compliant with PCI Express 3 as well, so that you can easily exchange, for example, adding cards. Starting about two or three years ago, uh, early simulations showed that the D transmitter D emphasis that was used in PCI Express 2 would not be sufficient at twice the data rate to, open, uh, to deliver an open eye after the longest channels. Um, so, um, when TX de emphasis was not sufficient, um, the decision was made that receiver equalization is um, the method of choice that opens up the, the eye after a long channel. And therefore, we're going to look into, uh, into a receiver and what is there. On the lower right, uh, here in blue, uh, you see the reference receiver. It, it has a, a few building blocks, and the building blocks that we are probably very um, familiar with the, are encircled in this orange rectangular, and this is the limiting amp and a flip-flop. This is the, a very basic receiver. And we also know uh, what this receiver, or we understand very well, the input uh, um, properties of the eye diagram that you would see here at the input that is required for proper functionality. For example, a certain eye height and a certain eye width, a certain amplitude, and an eye opening horizontally. Uh, so this is the base, uh, the basic, the basic receiver that is there. However, at the input, that which is the TP6 at the input of the real receiver, um, the signal, as I said before, may be closed. So we need equalization, and different means of equalization have been um, defined. First of all, we have the CTLE which is the continuous time linear equalizer, the frequency response of which is, is depicted here in, in number one. It has several DC or low frequency settings um, from minus five to minus 12 dB, and it always peaks at about four gigahertz. Um, then there, of course, is the CDR with, with a certain OGTF, observed jitter transfer function, uh, which does not have any peaking and has a uh, corner frequency of 10 megahertz. In addition to these things, uh, one tap DFE, this one here, has been um, um, proposed to open up the eye uh, after a long channel. 
Um, a detail is shown here in this gray box. These three components are the important components, equalization components that are there uh, to open up the eye sufficiently after a long channel. Of course, um, when, when you measure or when you calculate the eye opening at the inner receiver, the limiting amp and the flip-flop, you also need a, um, a reference model for the package. And this is the well-known pie type reference model that is also specified. It is important to keep in mind that at the, that the test point TP2P is basically the input of the basic receiver, which we all know, limiting amp and flip-flop. Okay, so that is something that we are going to discuss further during the session. So having said that the receiver equalization is necessary, um, we found with simulations that with reasonable equalization effort, and reasonable equalization effort is what I showed before, for example, a one-tap DFE and not a more complicated DFE, a maximum transfer rate of 8 giga transfers was possible. 10 gigabit could not be achieved. So um, the idea was uh, to get rid of the overhead of 8B, 10B coding, which is used in PCI Express 1 and 2, 25%, increasing the effective data rate uh, by 25%. Uh, and then we could end up at 8 giga transfers and would probably be fine with the methods that have been discussed before. However, uh, the 8B10 decoding brings in some benefits like CL alignment, DC balancing, and a limited length of consecutive identical bits uh, or digits, CID. So these have to be taken care of by a different method. And the different method is um, the 128B, 130B coding that has been uh, defined for PCI Express 3. It only has an overhead of 1.6%. It is depicted here. Um, and that is basically we have 16, from here to here, 16 symbols uh, of 8-bit length. This is 128 bits. Uh, and we start with a header, which is either a 10 or a 01, depending whether you uh, want to submit control information or data. But what is important, there's always a transition between the two bits. A 0, 0 or 1, 1 is not allowed. So CL alignment can be achieved uh, when the data is always transferred in blocks of 130 bits with a transition at always after or always within this little header. And so you have a transition every 130 bits. This gives you CL alignment. Um, the things like DC balance and CID are a little bit more complicated. And um, therefore, scrambling was uh, defined to be used with PCI Express 3. Um, data has always to be scrambled, and some control bits may be partially or totally unscrambled. The scrambler polynomial is of um, um, the power of 23, which means that the longest CID that could happen is uh, 23 bits. And the DC balance, in worst case, is achieved after one complete sequence of the PRVS. And this is 8 meg long for the uh, power of 23. And with 8 giga transfers, uh, lasts about a millisecond. So this um, makes the uh, receiving and, and um, design of uh, uh, CDR, for example, a little bit more complicated. However, here's the summary of what has been changed. So the data rate is only, in, or the transfer rate is only increased by a factor of 1.6. Coding has been changed. Um, the overhead is much smaller now. Um, we still can get sale alignment with the uh, transition every 130 bits. The scrambling uh, achieves a CID of 23, and the DC balance is guaranteed after milliseconds. Um, scrambling was optional for PCI Express 2. It is now always there for data. The effective data rate has nearly been doubled. It's 7.88 gigabits now instead of 4 gigabits, and this is because the 1.5% of overhead is missing. The most important point is that receiver testing is now normative, no more informative. And this is clear uh, because what, when you think of what I've said, the receiver with its equalizer achieves or enables transmission 
of 8 giga transfer data across PCI Express 2 compliant channels, which uh, were not really designed for these high speeds. So it is very important to do a very extensive um, receiver testing. And this is what we are going to discuss in the following. This picture in a uh, in very simple uh, way shows the, the way the, trans, uh, the receiver is tested. Um, it's a very generic setup. On the left side, you have a, pet, a bird consisting of a pattern generator and an error detector. Um, you transmit a signal to the ASIC, which resides on a custom test board. We are talking about ASICs here, not of, not of add-in cards. The base specification relates to ASICs. Um, so it must be on a custom test board. And the signal uh, that is uh, sent to the receiver under test is um, a signal that still has, as it was always the case, a very well-defined set of impairments. Um, we are also talking about the stressed eye that we are sending to the receiver under test. Um, and it's containing impairments like jitter and um, additional uh, sinusoidal um, interferences. Um, then the signal is looped back inside the ASIC through the transmitter and through the transmitter here and then fed to the uh, error detector of the BERT to count errors and to decide whether the receiver detected the uh, signal correctly or not. Correctly, that means in this case, as always, 10 to the minus 12 of a bit error ratio. Uh, what is so the test itself? The test itself is not different from what we have done at PCI Express 2 or in other digital standards. What is completely different, and this is what we're going to uh, talk about uh, for the next 15 to 20 minutes, is the construction of the stress test signal and the calibration of the receiver signal. And why this is so, um, I'm, I'm going to explain uh, with the next, uh, let's say, four or five uh, pictures. And for that purpose, I remove the error detector and the loopback path because we need to build up a little bit more than we have here on this picture, um, which does not mean that we do not need the loopback. It's still there, but we are now to only talking about the construction of the, te uh, the stress test signal. So I remove the loopback path, and uh, let's have a look at the, of, at the test generator. Uh, the pattern generator shall be capable of generating sinusoidal and random jitter. And in addition, uh, we want to have two sinusoidal signal sources, uh, one that can uh, interfere or can add a common mode, and another that can add a differential mode sinusoidal interference. Um, it's very often called noise, even in the specification sometimes, and also it's named noise very often. Um, I want to mention this because when we hear noise voltage, when we think of something uh, Gaussian distributed, this is not the case. It is a sinusoidal signal for test. Uh, it really stems from crosstalk noise, and this is why we very often talk of noise, which is not very precise, but I only wanted to clarify this point. So all these signals are superimposed in this combiner, and so the output of the generator is the TP1. The input of the uh, test board is the TP6. And uh, then the question arises, okay, thinking about what we have done in the past, can we use the TP6, the signal that is here at TP6, to do a calibration of this receiver stress signal? And it would be too easy if we could do that. So the TP6 cannot be used. Why is this? So the connection from these balls of the ASIC or the pins of this ASIC to the TP6, uh, and we call this a breakout channel, which is necessary uh, to connect test equipment because we cannot directly connect it at the balls. Um, this breakout channel at 8 giga transfers a second is not negligible in terms of its signal degradation, especially data dependent jitter or inter interference ISI. So a calibration of the stress signal must include this breakout channel. That would mean that we would have to, uh, to probe here at, at the ASIC balls or pins, which is practically not possible. You, you cannot really probe there. So a different approach was taken, and this is shown here. 
we duplicate the replica uh, the breakout channels on the on the test board uh, with the so-called replica channels. Uh, they create the important test point TP2 here, and as the replica channel shall really duplicate all the um, properties of the breakout channel, then basically the TP2 is equivalent, electrically equivalent to the pins or the balls of the ASIC, and so it is the closest point that we can really contact with test equipment and use it for calibration. So it is absolute, it is necessary, it is a um, requirement from the PCI Express base specification to have a custom test board uh, that not only has the breakout channels, which are of course there, but also has the replica channels so that we can do a calibration at this TP2. Um, before we now go into the, uh, dig down into the calibration itself, having talked about the channel so much, there's one more thing that we have to add in the test setup and that is, of course, some calibration channels, because there may be different situations where the transmitter on this side and the receiver work together, either when both are on the same board, then the channel between, is, between the two is not very long, or uh, when they are in a server, you may have a backplane in between, which is emulated by this long calibration channel. So three different test cases have been defined which are depicted on the, on the lower left here in this um, uh, diagram, which shows the S21 in dBs versus the frequency. Here's 4 gigahertz, here's 1 gigahertz. And it shows, for example, that the combination of the longest calibration channel and the breakout channel, it's always there, yeah, because you cannot get rid of the breakout channel. The insertion loss is about 20 dB at 4 gigahertz, the fundamental uh, frequency, uh, which is, Quite, quite, quite a bit, yeah, uh, and which causes a, a few problems, as we are going to see in a, in a few minutes. Um, an intermediate case has been defined with a short calibration, the green one here, and of course also this case is the combination of the short calibration channel and the breakout channel, and also one test case is when there's only the breakout channel, so no calibration channel in between the test generator on the left here and the receiver on the test or the custom test board on the right. So this is the test setup as it is specified by the base specification. Um, and the important thing I again want to uh, mention that is that the replica channel is required to create this test point TP2 for calibration. Okay, we are now going to think of the calibration. I removed everything that uh, we don't need uh, the ASIC anymore for the calibration. It's not required. We only have the the, the generator, the calibration channels, and the replica channel. Um, so if we connect test equipment here, for example, a real-time scope, to measure the signal, what we have done in the past is always um, that we specified the stress signal by its properties that we see at TP2. As I said before, um, we don't have an equalizer yet, and the eye at TP2 would be closed using the long calibration channel. So specifying the stress signal in terms of properties of the signal I is impractical because if, there's, if the I is closed, you cannot def, um, define the, the test signal with I height and I width. So um, an, another approach has been chosen and the approach that has been chosen is that you say, okay, we specify the I opening after um, all the equalization has been applied, and this we would see this as at the virtual uh, test point inside the ASIC, that is this TP2P, and you may remember I showed this in, uh, at the beginning of, of the session, this is basically the input of the limiting amplifier, so this simple receiver. So here, this is the point, the TP2P is the point where we specify the properties of the stressed I or the stress signal. Um, the consequence of this is that if I would only do a calibration measurement at TP2, this would not allow me to do the calibration. It is not sufficient because I have to apply um, the behavioral package model, the equalizer CTLE and DFE and the CDR to calculate, to simulate with software 
the eye opening at this virtual point because there it is defined in terms of a certain eye height and a certain eye width. So the com uh, a combination of a signal measurement and a software simulation is necessary to calibrate the stress signal. Okay, that sounds complicated at first moment, and it's, it's also not that simple, but uh, we will see uh, what, what we can do to make it uh, relatively simple. Next step is, okay, provided this is, uh, we have understood what we have to do, uh, the first natural thing would be, okay, we take the test pattern that is specified for the receiver, we turn on all the signal impairments, that is uh, the jitter of the pattern generator, the sinusoidal noise sources or sinusoidal interference sources, measure the signal here at TP2P, and then go to some software program and calculate the eye opening at TP2P. This would be the first natural thing. And for a while, this has been considered in, in the electrical workgroup that does the specification for the, the base specification. Um, the only problem that appeared is that especially when you use the when you use the long calibration channel, as I said, the eye opening is no more there. The eye at TP2P is very small. The signal at TP2 is very small, and you're very close to the noise floor of um, available real-time oscilloscopes. And not only the noise floor, but also the jitter, the intrinsic jitter. So really measuring this completely. Um, this, this test pattern with all the impairments there is also impractical because due to the intrinsic noise of the scope, the signal would be much smaller. The signal that we measured would be much smaller than the signal really is. And then even if we do this um, simulation of all the equalization, finally, we would think that the signal has the right eye height and eye width, but it would indeed be wider open because the intrinsic noise, intrinsic jitter, already closed the signal. So what would happen is that we would not really stress the receiver under test as much as we intended. So this doesn't work. Alternative method has to be come up with, and the, the trick is to divide the calibration process of the stress signal into three separate steps. First of all, it is of course necessary to characterize the whole setup starting from the generator up to TP2 with all the cables in between, the calibration channels, the combine and everything. This has to be characterized, of course. It may be different at different uh, locations. This is necessary. How can we characterize this when we, said, when we just learned that measuring at TP2 is very critical because of the noise of the real-time scope? Okay, what we have to do is to get rid of the noise is we have to use averaging. Um, Two things with averaging. First, if we would have noise or jitter on the signal and use averaging, then all the impairments would be gone. At least the random jitter or all the impairments that are not correlated to the pattern, they would be gone. So it doesn't make any sense to turn them on at that moment. And in addition, uh, we, may, we, we have to use um, a signal uh, that is not too long uh, and, and can be averaged with a certain uh, amount of memory. The test pattern, which is close to PIBIS 23, it's the so-called modified compliance pattern, is more than 8 megs long, and this would be much too long. So a very simple approach has been chosen. You just use a clock signal that is divided by 256, 121 eights, 121 zeros. You use averaging, and you get a very clean, and now I say step response, because the first half or the second half, or maybe the average of it, um, is, is called the step response. We use this step response, which measures the whole setup, starting from the generator to TP2, and use this as an input to a simulator software that allows to, on one hand, calculate an eye opening on a PRBS signal with a probability level of 10 to the minus 12. It allows, it has knowledge of all the receivers, of uh, all the equalizers of the reference receiver, and it can also simulate the impairments and then it would find an eye opening, and then we decide when we see the eye opening if it's small enough, and let's say by hand, at first moment in software, increase the impairments until we find the desired eye opening as it is specified. And when this is done, we would go into hardware again and do some measurements and calibrate those impairments which require calibration 
one at a time at the best suited test point with the best suited test signal. Um, so it is probably not necessary to calibrate random jitter or sinusoidal jitter when you use a, a good and calibrated specified pattern generator. And it would also be difficult to do that at TP2 as we have discussed before. So if, it should, if somebody really wishes to do that, do that at TP1. The thing that really needs to be calibrated at TP2 is one of the sinusoidal interferences because the differential mode sinusoidal interference is specified as a 2.1 gigahertz sinusoid. And the 2.1 gigahertz sinusoid is clearly attenuated through these channels. And this depends on the setup and cannot be uh, taken care of upfront. So this measurement has to be done here at TP2. The best suited pattern for measuring um, an, an a superimposed signal on data pattern is to really have no data pattern. That is, set the pattern generator to DC. Do not disconnect it because this would change the impedances of the whole setup, but set it to producing just the constant zero or constant one. And then you can measure the 2.1 gigahertz signal here using averaging. And this again gives a very clear and accurate reading. And when you've done all this, then you finally perform the test uh, with a modified compliance pattern and all the impairments turned on simultaneously. I have put all the steps together in, in a flow chart. Um, we have basically, we have three columns uh, on the left. This has to do with the verification of the test setup. The middle column shows the steps that are needed to simulate the stressed eye and the rightmost is uh, how we calibrate the impairments. Um, I use a color code. The orange one is for real measurements with hardware. Um, the green is something that the user has to do or an automation software that is at the moment is considered to be uh, developed from Agilent Technologies to automate this. And the blue one is done with a so-called CSIM. This is the Statistical Eye Analysis Simulator, a special software that has been created by the PCI SIG members, for PCI SIG members to do this statistical simulation of this eye. Uh, a few minutes, uh, just one or two minutes to walk through this. Uh, you set the test generator to the clock signal. You measure the signal with the oscilloscope. Uh, you create the step response and finally, with having the step response and knowing in, as a model the input signal, you can create the S, S to 1 parameters of the whole setup and you can decide whether this is within the range that it was specified for the channels. You remember these three uh, ranges for the different test cases with only breakout channels or with a short and long calibration channel. If the signal is too large or too small, then you are allowed to play a little bit with the de-emphasis of the generator, up to 2 dB is allowed, and measure again if you can pull it into the range uh, that is desired. If, if that's not possible, then you have to, to change and come up with a different, uh, different setup. If it is finally in the specifications, then uh, we basically we transfer the signal into the IC, uh, applying the uh, behavioral package model, and we start the simulation the CSIM simulator, which calculates the eye opening and optimizes all the filters, all the equalizers, and finally calculates an eye width and an eye height. If this is too, wide, too open, too much open, the, the eye height is too large and the eye width is too large or too small, then we have to adapt the amount of um, some of the impairments and redo the calculation until we really reach the eye height as it is defined and the eye width as it is defined. Then we know the settings that we have to use. Some are variable here in this, in this program. We're going to talk about this, and some are given from the specifications. Uh, we calibrate the parameters that we have to. We set up the test generator, and we can run the test. OK, I, I want to show one thing here, which is used for making the decision whether the eye width and the eye height are OK. Um, this diagram here on the right shows the output of the CSIM simulator. So this is an eye opening. Looks a little bit unusual. It would be would take too long to explain everything that that is behind it. The important thing is that you see these uh, dashed lines here. Uh, they are for different um, BER levels, 
and the inner, the white one, is for BR 10 to the minus 12. And what the eye opening is here in, in terms of eye height, this is 25 millivolts, and eye width is about 0.3 UIs. The target that I try to simulate here is to get an eye height of 25 millivolts. This is a specification. And what I had to do, I had uh, to achieve this in software, I had to use uh, a few jitter values. That is, this, uh, this jitter here is the random jitter. This, you see, 12 picoseconds. 12.5 uh, picoseconds is 0.1 UI of uh, sinusoidal jitter. And this here is the common mode, um, sorry, the differential mode, sinusoidal interference, 22 millivolts. This is required. And then I get the, the right eye opening. This is what the CSIM software delivers. Um, okay, so this is what I wanted to say about the calibration. And I have talked about the, let's say, more theoretical or principle setup. And I now want to go uh, and show a practical test setup as it can be built up today. Before I do that, I want to um, detail a little bit more the necessary tests that are there. Uh, because what the EWG did for the base specification, uh, they also separated um, two tests that are really looking at different parameters of the receiver, um, and they specified a stressed jitter test and a stressed voltage test. The stressed jitter test is more looking at the eye width and the stressed voltage test at the eye height. So two different tests have been defined. I start with the stressed jitter, jitter test because it's, the setup is simpler. Um, we still have the generator here, um, and I, I showed uh, the capabilities of being able to generate random jitter and sinusoidal jitter here with two additional sources. The test setup only has the long calibration channel. You see the 20 dB loss. Of course, there's the replica channel or the breakout channel and then the receiver and the test. The stress jitter uh, has one more, or let's say the I width will be calibrated or will be achieved by adjusting the random jitter no, uh, amplitude, and uh, so this is what, what the error is, is, is here for. And in addition to having this sinusoidal source at one frequency, uh, this shall be, let's say, swept across this frequency range starting at 33 kilohertz uh, of, with an amplitude of one UI going to one megahertz, then decreases down to 0.1 UI at 10 megahertz and up to 100 megahertz of sinusoidal frequency. Um, for this sinusoidal jitter. Um, okay, so this setup is for stress jitter testing, shooting at understanding the eye width capabilities or the, the, eye, or the horizontal eye opening that is required. And I, sh I started with this one because it's the, the simpler one. It is a subset of the stressed voltage eye test. Uh, I added the combiner and the two sources here, differential mode and common mode sinusoidal interference. You see three sources are now constant, and only the differential mode sinusoidal interface, uh, interference is variable. And this is the, the, the source that you, uh, let's say, turn the knob to decrease the eye height to the desired level. Okay. And this is, test is done for three channels. That is the 20, 12, and 2.5 dB of insertion loss. Um, I want to, to look into this a little bit uh, more in detail. So I open up the combiner to look, see what is inside. I move the, the brown sources to the left, and we see what is in the, inside the combiner. Um, so the two sources, um, the common mode sources, is split up in, in signals for the normal and the complement path. And usually, well, probably in every lab, um, sinusoidal sources for 120 megahertz and also for 2.1 gigahertz are available, but they are not differential, so you need, probably you would need a balloon uh, to generate a differential mode sinusoidal interference. And basically, at this point here, you have both interference voltages added, and you combine these with a signal that's coming from the pattern generator. So this looks relatively complicated. You need the, the BERT generator. Uh, you need two sources and um, some sort of plumbing. But it's not that bad because uh, everything that is um, within this blue area 
is uh, integrated in the Agilent 4903B. And I'm going to show this in a little bit more detail now. Um, so going back, we still see uh, the setup is constant. We still see the, the splitters and the rest is now changed with real existing hardware. So here on the lower left, we see that part of the front panel of the 4903B that has all the connectors. And the first thing that we do, we follow these light blue lanes uh, um, or cables go into the 4916B, the de-emphasis converter, which finally generates the data pattern with the required de-emphasis. Um, what we do here with the brown cables and the brown accessories is we create all the sinusoidal interferences that are necessary. So we take the second output of this serial bird, so it's a serial bird with two outputs, and we use a 120 megahertz clock signal, run it through transition time converter and get 120 megahertz sinusoid. We split it up into two signals, one for normal, one for complement, and we run it into the input of our option J20, which was originally designed uh, to create ISI uh, for data pattern, which is connected from here to here. This is not the way we're using it at the moment. We're just using it for adding, there, there are uh, adder circuits in there, and we use it because there is the differential mode sinusoidal interference source is built in here. So uh, the J20 offers the differential source for 2.1 gigahertz. So the common mode uh, sinusoidal source comes from the second channel, and the differential mode comes from the J20. Okay, uh, we add everything up and send it into the receiver and the test. And this setup is the same for stress voltage and stress jitter testing, only that you do not need these voltages, you, uh, these uh, sinusoidal interferences, you simply turn them down to zero. So um, let's have a look how this continues. Um, I want to show uh, some pictures from the GUI, the graphical user interface from, from the Jaybird. This is the jitter setup page, and this allows you to set up in a very straightforward and calibrated way to set up a uh, periodic jitter, which is the sinusoidal jitter, and the random jitter. If you look into the details of the random jitter, pressing this button here would open this page on this side, and you see there's some sort, well, okay, I've set it to an amplitude of 24 milliuis, that is the three picoseconds which is required, and here's some filtering, um, which is also required because the filtering for the RJ is that it should only be between 10 megahertz and one gigahertz. We have a, a 10 megahertz high pass filter, which we turn on, and then we have the random jitter that is required. The jitter tolerance compliance measurement allows to sweep the jitter, the SJ, uh, from 33 kilohertz. You see the 33 kilohertz here, and here's the 100 megahertz. I just selected 10 points. You can, can select any, any number, um, and then you sweep the sinusoidal jitter according to the specified profile. This shows the setup of the um, voltage interferences. So this is uh, how we generate 120 megahertz clock with the second channel. Amplitude can directly be set, and uh, the transition time converter generates a sinusoid uh, where the harmonics are suppressed more than 25 dB, which is uh, very much sufficient for this common mode interference signal. Setting up the differential mode sinusoidal interference is can be done directly with the interference channel option, which allows to set the amplitude and the frequency of the differential mode sinusoidal interference. This can be done right away. Um, one thing that I wanted to show, which is very handy, not only for this application, but in general, um, the Jaybird um, features um, pattern sequencer. What I did here is I created four blocks with different patterns. You remember for, for creating the step response, we wanted to have a clock divided by 256. Um, in case that you wanted to calibrate the jitter, uh, you, you would use a clock pattern. When you want to calibrate the differential or common mode sinusoidal interference, you want to have a static pattern. And finally, uh, you run the test pattern. Uh, you, you see every block is uh, looped infinitely until a manual break is issued. Uh, you can do this by pressing this 
button on the graphical user interface or issuing this command uh, from from a remote interface. So this is uh, the way you would do it with the JBird 4903B. This is a summary. Random jitter and sinusoidal jitter are generated directly with the jitter setup page. Sweep is possible with the tolerance compliance measurement. Common mode and differential mode sinusoid interference, you can use the auxiliary data channel and you can use the option J20 for the differential mode uh, sinusoidal interference also directly. The generator, the D emphasis is generated with 4916B. Okay, so I would like to summarize here what we have seen before I give an outlook into CHEM. So we have seen that the error-free signal detection and transmission, and transmission systems with data rates beyond 5 giga transfers is difficult and really requires equalization when a significant amount of channel is in between transmitter and receiver. And when receiver equalization is necessary, and which is this circuit which guarantees proper signal detection, then of course thorough testing is necessary, and of course you need a well-calibrated stress signal to finally guarantee uh, interoperability. The definition of a suitable test setup um, and the marginal measurement capabilities for this very small signal require that the test signal is constructed in software or requires the whole calibration process that I've described. Solutions from Agilent, uh, I have presented them in hardware. Uh, it is the test setup for the 4903 generator and the de-emphasis signal converter and an automation software for the calibration process will also be available in the near future. Um, two more points on the agenda, uh, but uh, we're basically through with all this. I wanted to give a little bit of an outlook what is going to happen for uh, within the CHEM group. CHEM group, CHEM stands for Card Electromechanical, and what they do is they specify beside mechanics also the tests uh, for add-in cards and motherboards. Um, this is a very, very, very much simplified a test setup, you see the, a bird here. I did not show the de-emphasis converter, which is required, but I wanted to keep this easy. And you probably know from workshops that we have a compliance baseboard and a compliance load board uh, to the calibration. Um, this is what we have for PCI Express 3. It will be a little bit different for PCI Express, uh, which we have for PCI Express 2. It will be a little bit different for PCI Express 3, and that is that the co Compliance Baseboard Revision 3 is enhanced by an additional board with a connector to emulate backplanes as good as possible and to have a long calibration channel on, on this board because you have seen that the calibration and the test needs to be done at least uh, with, uh, for, for stressed jitter with only the longest channel and for stressed voltage we have different channels. So the CAM is shooting for probably only making the test with the longest channel. Um, you would do the calibration uh, on the compliance load board here with um, um, connectors here and go to the real-time scope. The calibration procedure is very similar to what a, or will, will be very similar, I have to say. The CAM specification is, is in a much more preliminary state than the base specification is. Um, so you will do it probably in a very similar way as I described it for the base specification. And the test setup finally is you remove the compliance load board and put in your add-in card where your PCI Express ASIC is sitting and you measure um, the signal that is looped back with the error detector. So this is probably um, the test setup that we will see uh, in workshops starting sometime next year, springtime. Okay, finally, a little bit of literature uh, for, your for your study. Um, first thing is, uh, literature or links, let's say. Uh, we have a new uh, website which allows you to um, chat or blog with the with our experts for the different standards, PCI Express, USB, CLATA, and so on. And uh, if you use this link, you will find a lot of details and can ask your questions there. In addition, we have some material, um, an application note containing what I have talked about in the last 45 minutes uh, is will be coming under this um, literature number 
soon. And we, we have the links uh, on our website for Jaybird for receiver testing, for test automation. Uh, of course, here are the links also for the PCI SIG. Um, all the webcasts that we have within this series of high-speed digital tests uh, can be found under this link uh, that I've noted here. Um, and maybe uh, you should also be aware of some legal aspects. Uh, of course, PCI Express is a trademark of the PCI SIG. The material that I have used during this webinar um, is a compilation of the not yet public, and that's the reason why I have this uh, legal note here, of the not yet public PCI Express base or card electromechanical specification. And I want to mention that the CSIM software, the simulation software, is a development of AMD and it's available for members, uh, for PCI-Seq members through the EWG website. Thank you for watching this Agilent Technologies webcast. For more recorded webcasts, subscribe to our Agilent TM webcast YouTube channel. All of our webcasts are held live. Interact with our Agilent experts in the live Q&A sessions and gain access to Agilent materials. To view our upcoming live webcasts and to sign up for free, go to our website, www.agilent.com slash find slash web underscore seminar. <laughs>